Welcome back to the second session of the 35th Annual Family Conference of the National MPS Society. This is the first day of our science sessions. If you're just joining me, my name is Dr. Matthew Ellenwood, and I am the Chief Scientific Officer at the Society. Our next two sessions will focus on a drug repurposing approach uh, in terms of treatment for the MPS disorders. Drug repurposing is the approach where you take an approved drug or a drug that has at least made it through the safety phase of a clinical trial and look for its efficacy in MPS. Our two presenters have both had or are currently funded by the National MPS Society. And our first presenter, Dr. Leela Simonaro, is also a member of our scientific advisory board. Dr. Simonaro has been involved in MPS and lysosomal storage disease research for over two decades. She comes to us from Mount Sinai uh, Hospital uh, uh, Research Unit, where she has been working on bone diseases in the MPS using mouse uh, cell culture and large animal models for many years. And she'll talk to us, give us an overview of an area of research that she has targeted that she has really pioneered actually using pentacin polysulfate. So without further ado, I will hand over the platform to a wonderful presentation from Dr. Leela Simonaro. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the MPS Society for giving me the opportunity to present our work on PPS for MPS. The goal of our laboratory is to identify common disease mechanisms in the MPS disorders and to develop new therapies that can be used in all patients. In our lab, we use various animal models of MPS, but for these studies, we use the MPS3A mice with a focus on brain disease and the MPS6 rats with a focus on skeletal disease. In addition, we collaborated closely with Dr. Mark Haskins at the University of Pennsylvania, and studies were done with the MPS1 dogs with a focus on the cardiovascular disease. Now, the results from all these studies have already been published. Now, based on the results obtained from these studies, this led us to the identification of a common inflammatory pathway that is defective in MPS due to GAG accumulation. So what exactly is inflammation? Inflammation is a series of biochemical reactions that the body normally uses to fight infection and other trauma. In chronic diseases, such as MPS, this inflammatory system is turned on, but never turns off. And this is because of GAG accumulation. It is actually the GAG that is the trigger for the inflammatory response. Now one could use immunosuppressing therapies that are available for inflammation, but these can increase the risk of infection, cancer, and other diseases. Therefore, this led us to identify a more targeted anti-inflammatory therapy using the drug pentacen polysulfate, also known as PPS. Now before we initiated our studies with PPS, we wanted to do a proof of concept to show the role of inflammation in MPS. What we did is we took a normal animal, which has a defect where it never actually develops inflammation, and we bred it to an MPS 7 mouse. And as a result, we produced a double knockout which is an animal that has no inflammation, but still has MPS. If one looks at the snout of this animal, you can see that it's more elongated, just like a normal, when, and compares, compared to the flattened, broadened snout of the MPS, and it's also larger in size. As evident in the femurs here on the left, in the middle is the femur from the double knockout, which is almost equivalent in size to the TLR4, the normal animal, when compared to the shortened uh, MPS animal. 
Therefore, by eliminating inflammation, we can recover some normal phenotype. But as expected, this animal still has gag storage. It doesn't have inflammation, but it is still accumulating gags. If one looks at these white, large balloon cells in the double knockout, this is in the cartilage, one could still see that there is gag accumulation, just like the MPS7 mouse. And one compares that to these flattened uh, chondrocytes that don't have um, any gag storage. So we knew now that inflammation is very important in MPS. So we wanted to proceed with our studies with PPS. But what exactly is PPS? So PPS is a natural product. It's isolated from beech trees. We know it has strong anti-inflammatory properties and it is not immunosuppressant. It's been approved by the FDA and EMA, which is the European equivalent of the FDA. And it comes in two different formulations. It comes in an oral form in the US for plain, painful bladder syndrome. The common name is Elmeron. And in Europe, it's available as a subcutaneous injection for deep vein thrombosis, commonly known as SP54. Its safety profile has well been documented and it's potentially a very easy add-on to existing therapies, such as ERTs or gene therapies, um, in which Dr. Smith will um, discuss in the uh, following uh, talk. So based on our studies in the animal models, what exactly did we see? We saw that if we block inflammation, we improve clinical disease we saw an improvement in skeletal and cartilage abnormalities in cardiovascular system. We saw an improvement in the collapsed tracheas, which were now rigid and stiffened and opened. We saw an increase in joint range of motion. We saw an increase in mobility. We saw an increase in um, a reduction in pain. And we saw a reduction of neural inflammation. But on top of this, we also had a very surprising result. We also observed that PPS treatment alone led to gag reduction. And this was more dramatic in animals receiving weekly or every other week subcutaneous injections, which is under the skin, versus an oral administration. Now, this is just an example of sub, uh, gag storage reduction in the cartilage of MPS6 uh, rats. On the upper panels, we have the normal animal versus MPS. If one looks at the arrow, these large balloon cells in the cartilage are filled with gags. On the lower panels, we have three different doses. We have one, two and four mg per kilogram. And if one looks at the middle panel at the cartilage, you could see a very significant reduction of gag storage in the cartilage. You no longer see these large ballooned cells in the cartilage as you do in the one mg or the untreated. And we also saw significant reduction in the four mg per kg but the most efficacious dose is two mg per kg where we saw the best results. In addition, we looked at urine gags in the rats that were treated with PPS and we compared the subcutaneous to the oral. And if one looks at the black, which is the untreated, we did see a reduction with both modes of administration but there was a more significant reduction in gags, in the urine gags, in the animals that received the subcutaneous injections. So we know that PPS has an impact on the non-neurological tissues, but does PPS actually impact the brain? So we looked at inflammatory markers in the CSF or the cerebral spinal fluid of the MPS1 dogs. The CSF is a fluid that actually flows in the spine 
and goes um, up into the brain. So it's kind of a reflection of what's going on in the brain. So we looked at two different markers in the CSF, IL-1 and IL-8, and we saw that there was a reduction with both treatments of modes of administration of PPS. But again, we had more significant reduction in the animals that received the subcutaneous injections, which is shown in purple. In addition, we looked actually at the mouse brains that were treated. This is one marker that we looked at. This is GFAP, which is an inflammation marker. We looked at three different areas of the brain, the thalamus, the cortex, and the uh, hippocampus. If one looks at the upper panels, these are the untreated. In all three areas, one could see that there's more of these dark brown, uh, what I call squigglies in the brain, um, which is reflecting where the GFAP is, where the inflammation is. If one looks at the lower panels, one could see a significant reduction of these brown markings in all three areas of the brain, which is reflection of a reduction in neural inflammation in these various areas of the brain in the treated animals. In addition, we wanted to see if there was a reduction in the GAG, which is heparin sulfate in this case in these MPS3A mice, in the same areas of the brain. In the upper panels, we see, if one looks at the brown markings, this is where the heparin sulfate is. This is marks the heparin sulfate accumulation and compares it to the lower panels of the treated mice one again could see a reduction in these brown markings, which is mirroring the fact that there is less heparin sulfate accumulation in the treated animals. We also wanted to see how this translated to behavioral studies um, in these animals. We looked at hyperactivity and improved motor skills in the treated animals. The first study is a marble burying, which shows uh, anxiety and hyperactivity in the animals. The black column is how many marbles the untreated animals buried versus normal, which is white, and purple, which is treated. Again, the uh, treated animals showed almost uh, less marble burying, which is almost equivalent to the marbles that the normal animals are buried. On the right, this is a motor skill test showing learning and testing, and the treated animals showed less time um, to do their tests as opposed to the MPS animals after learning. So the MPS treated animals were almost equivalent to the normal animals in their learning skills. So based on these animals' results, two proof of concept clinical trials were undertaken in MPS adults. There was an MPS1 study in Germany and an MPS2 study done in Japan. The MPS1 study had four patients and this was a six month trial uh, with Dr. Henneman and her staff, and the MPS2 adult study was done with three patients in Japan, which was a three-month study undertaken by Otto Ori and his staff, and these two studies are both published. Both studies had no serious side effects from the uh, PPS administration. The only adverse effect they saw was minor bruising or a temporary pain at the actual injection site which was very transient, either a few hours or it was totally gone by 24 hours. So this is just a, a summary of the effects that were seen in the patients. In the MPS1 study, four out of the three patients, uh, uh, three out of the four patients had an increased range of motion, but all four patients had 
a significant reduction of urine gags, which was almost uh, normalized. In the MPS2 study, they looked at pain. Uh, one, pain had, uh, one patient had almost no uh, pain after study. The second patient actually never had pain um, from the beginning of the study. And the uh, third patient also did not really have an issue with pain. These patients were not selected for pain. Um, they were just selected for having MPS. But all patients, all three patients, just like the MPS1 patient, had a significant decrease in GADS, um, which above uh, their baseline. Uh, we looked at uh, inflammatory biomarkers in the serum from the MPS2 patients that were treated for three months with PPS. These are two different uh, inflammatory markers, MIF and TNF. And if one looks at the purple, um, in four, uh, five out of the six uh, points that were looked at, there was a significant decrease in the inflammatory markers, which is um, mirrors that there is a reduction of inflammation in these pa patients due to PPS. So these studies were done in adults, but now we wanted to see if PPS could actually be used in, in pediatric patients. So two pediatric NPS6 patients, which were actually siblings, were treated in Japan. This was a three-month study. They received once weekly subcutaneous injections plus their weekly ERT. Their first step for four weeks was 0.5 mg per kg. On um, one safety was recorded for the first step, then they proceeded to the second step, which was for the remainder of three weeks, which was at one mg per kg. They had no adverse reactions and evaluations are now underway. Now, based on these results, PPS is now licensed from Mount Sinai to two drug companies who are continuing clinical trials. RecMed uh, is a company in Japan, and Paradigm Biopharma is an Australian company which will actually continue clinical trials in the rest of the world. So there is an ongoing clinical study now in Japan. This is a phase 2B with subcutaneous injections in various MPSs and also ML2. Um, they had one uh, adult MPS1 patient with ERT, one adult MPS2 patient without ERT, two pediatric MPS6 patients with ERT, and two pediatric MLT, ML2 patients. They will receive uh, 1.5 milligram per kg once a week for 13 weeks in two cycles. What they will do is after six weeks, they will have an evaluation and then continue for the remaining, remainder of six weeks. And they have now confirmed that they are safety up to 1.5 mix per kid. Uh, discussions are now underway with the regulatory authorities regarding a phase three study. Uh, Paradigm is also undergoing some clinical studies. It has now commenced a phase two clinical trial in MPS1 patients in Australia. There are now three patients currently enrolled are uh, receiving PPS. There's one patient that has completed now week 29 as of the 30th of May, and they've seen no adverse events. They are also planning a phase two clinical trial uh, in MPS6 in Brazil in 12 patients. And the criteria is that they've been on ERT for a minimum of 12 months, and they're also considering doing a trial in the US following this. So our conclusions. Our conclusions are that GAG-mediated inflammation is an important component of all NPS diseases. It does not matter which GAG is being accumulated, whether germatin sulfate, heparin sulfate, chondroitin sulfate, 
all the GAGs are mediators of inflammation. PPS may be an effective MPS drug that reduces inflammation and GAG storage in multiple MPS types. We know that subcutaneous treatment reduced inflammation in the serum and non-neurological and neurological tissues. And clinical trials are now underway in multiple MPS types and ML. I like to acknowledge everyone that worked on uh, these studies and also the recent research has been uh, funded by various uh, societies and foundations. And thank you for your attention and be well. Thank you so much, Dr. Alila. That was a wonderful overview of an important area of research that has been uncovered over the last decade. Our next speaker is Dr. Jody Smith. Jody is a PhD neuroscientist as well as a board certified veterinary pathologist and has been working on lysosomal storage diseases with me actually when I was uh, still in my academic position for the last six years. She also comes from a background working on neurodegenerative diseases in large animals as well. So she's well suited to this area of work that she has taken on. And she will be discussing PPS therapy in the MPS canine 3B model. I also want to encourage the audience to please be forthcoming with questions. We'll have about a 10 to 15 minute question period at the end of uh, today's session. And without further ado, uh, let's roll Jody. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure and an honor to speak with you today and a professional privilege uh, for me to follow my esteemed colleague, Dr. Seminaro's talk. Her and her team's work in the repurposing of uh, PPS for MPS disorders has been uh, momentous and has inspired and influenced our PPS trial in the dog model of San Filippo B that I will discuss today. I have no uh, conflicts of interest or financial disclosures. My personal disclosure statement is that I am a veterinarian and so therefore I must include a picture of my unruly little hound dog in this presentation. Being a veterinarian scientist, I thought I would begin this talk with just a little bit of background on lysosomal storage diseases in veterinary patients, especially as it relates to identifying models of these diseases. In animals, lysosomal storage diseases can be genetic or inherited, um, as in people, or they can be acquired, uh, which means that the animal doesn't have a genetic mutation causing the disease, but it has been exposed to something that has, has caused a storage disease. One of the most common uh, or more common examples in veterinary medicine is the ingestion of toxic plants, um, especially a group of plants referred to as local weed. I've put the genus names here for the plant folks. Um, ingestion of this plant by cattle, sheep, or horses uh, can decrease the function of a particular lysosomal enzyme. Um, alpha manasidase, and that can cause a lysosomal storage disease. The majority of storage diseases we see in companion animals tend to be genetic, um, and they are rare in veterinary patients as well. Uh, but despite their rarity, nearly all lysosomal storage diseases that have been identified in people have also been identified in an animal. Uh, down here in the right-hand corner, this is a table uh, that is literally pages long um, from a review of lysosomal storage diseases in animals. Here I've just included uh, the section on the MPSs, uh, which have been found uh, mostly in dogs and cats, uh, but also goats and um, oddly enough, a flock of emus. These animals, um, veterinary patients with lysosomal storage diseases, have clinical signs of the disease. Uh, that's why they're um, initially taken or presented to their veterinarian. Uh, veterinarians may suspect a lysosomal storage disease 
based on the age of the animal and the particular signs it's showing. Um, and then an appropriate diagnostic workup would follow. Uh, if a molecular or genetic test already exists um, for a particular lysosomal storage disease, the diag diagnosis is uh, perhaps a bit easier to make. Uh, but if not, usually it requires um, pretty motivated owners and clinicians uh, pairing with researchers to continue pursuing the diagnosis. Um, and it's in these situations actually often where we will identify and can then develop uh, large animal models for studying these diseases. So another advantage of um, canine, feline, and other large animal models, in addition to their large size, uh, long lifespan, et cetera, is that they present with clinical disease. So that we know, um, or so we know that they will be uh, good or authentic models from that standpoint. And um, it's, it's important to maintain these large animal models, but they're not easy to maintain, um, as they're often both uh, social and institutional challenges and sometimes barriers to using these animals uh, for research. The canine model of MPS3B came about during one of those situations where a motivated owner was connected with some astute clinicians, um, including Dr. Ellenwood, um, when he was at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine and MPS3B was eventually diagnosed. Um, Penny, so this is her up in the, the right-hand corner, uh, she was one of those first patients, um, and she had had a litter of pups, actually, um, in which a male, uh, Max, this handsome guy here in the center, was determined to carry the mutation, um, and so he was used to start uh, the research colony that was eventually brought to Iowa State University by Dr. Ellenwood. Um, and this is the colony that um, is still being used and we're still studying and, and using uh, for research today. So these animals uh, start to develop neurological disease at about 18 months of age, um, which would be uh, during their adolescent phase. And they have disease findings uh, similar to those seen in human patients. They have been used for various uh, kinds of studies, um, including this gene therapy study reported in 2011, um, which uh, led to the launch of a, a clinical trial in France. Those initial reports um, and studies predated um, my entry into the MPS research field. I started uh, collaborating or working jointly with Dr. Ellenwood's group a handful of years ago, and we have focused on really uh, defining when we can first measure changes in the brain um, and then characterizing how the disease progresses or changes over time in the dog model. So what we found is that we can measure changes in the brain uh, as early as uh, four months of age and that nervous system disease or pathology in the dog replicates that seen in human patients. So continuing to make the case that the canine model um, is important for study, especially therapy studies where a number of advantages such as size, uh, long lifespan, availability of um, you know, sophisticated veterinary diagnostic tools and tests, et cetera, make them attractive models. So speaking of uh, therapy studies, on to the main topic of this talk which is an initial study we have conducted in the dog looking at the effects of PPS treatment on uh, 3B disease in this model. Um, as has been mentioned, um, there have been a number of studies which have shown beneficial effects of PPS um, in both animal models of, of various um, MPS types um, and also in clinical trials. PPS treatment has not been reported for MPS3B in particular yet, um, so we decided to investigate it in the canine model, and we hypothesized or speculated that subcutaneous administration of PPS would decrease both brain inflammation and lysosomal storage. For our study, we compared three groups of dogs, dogs without the disease, um, or the unaffected group, 
Dogs with the disease, uh, but not treated with PPS, so the untreated group. And then dogs with the disease that were treated uh, with PPS, so the PPS treated group. Uh, each group consisted of three animals. PPS was given subcutaneously uh, every two weeks, starting when the animals were newborns and continuing until they were four months of age. At four months, uh, we collected uh, nervous tissue. Uh, for the unaffected and untreated control groups, um, archived tissues or tissues saved back from previous studies were used. Uh, this allows us to, to decrease the number of animals that we have to use for any given study. And then all of those tissues were treated the same way. Uh, they were analyzed uh, for markers of um, MPS3B disease. What we found was that PPS treatment resulted in a widespread positive effect on the central nervous system. So we observed decreased inflammation in the brain and spinal cord and also decreased signs of storage. The image and graphs here um, on the left are showing reduced markers of gliosis. Uh, gliosis is an indicator of inflammation or reaction of the nervous tissue. So we saw decreases in um, all areas of the brain that we examined, as well as the spinal cord. Uh, depending on the particular marker of inflammation, and, and we used uh, two in this study, um, and the particular region of the brain, um, we could detect up to a 43% uh, reduction in inflammation in the brains of PPS-treated dogs compared to untreated animals. Um, but again, there was regional uh, variability with that. The picture above the graph um, is showing the red-brown staining of one of these markers in the brain. Uh, this color is what we would measure to uh, generate the values um, that are present in the graph. So um, when looking at the pictures, less of this red-brown color is good. That means less inflammation. So we could see that difference between untreated and treated um, animals even before we used uh, software to calculate those numerical differences. The smaller graph in the center is showing values um, from one part of the brain, uh, although uh, results were similar in all regions of the brain that we examined, um, of a signaling molecule that encourages um, inflammation or TNF-alpha. The blue bar represents uh, the normal or unaffected group. Um, so even in uh, unaffected dogs or dogs uh, without MPS3B disease, there are detectable levels of this molecule. Um, the red bar represents uh, untreated MPS3B dogs. And then the green bar represents the PPS-treated dogs. So uh, with PPS treatment, we also saw a decrease uh, you know, closer to normal values of this inflammation causing molecule. The image and the graph on the right uh, are showing decreased signs of storage. So here we were looking indirectly at storage material by looking at differences in the uh, volume or concentration of lysosomes in untreated uh, versus treated dogs. Again, the picture on the top is showing uh, red-brown staining, uh, this time of lysosomes. So less uh, red-brown color is good and would indicate decreased storage. And so putting numbers um, to those differences, we similarly saw some variation uh, among different areas of the central nervous system, um, but up to a 16% uh, decrease in lysosomal storage in the brains of PPS-treated dogs compared to untreated dogs. So what we could conclude from this preliminary study is that treatment with biweekly, uh, meaning every two weeks in this case, subcutaneous PPS starting in the neonatal period, uh, decreased CNS inflammation and lysosomal storage in this uh, large animal model of MPS3B. These results are consistent with what has previously been reported um, with regard to PPS therapy for other MPS types and suggest that PPS may be beneficial as a complementary therapy 
for NPS3B. Our next step in this work, um, supported by a grant from the National NPS Society, is to evaluate PPS in combination with a gene therapy to determine if there is a synergistic or a combined effect of the two therapies. So this study will be done in collaboration with uh, colleagues at the University of Florida um, and also an industry partner. Uh, for this study, we will administer a one-time gene therapy into the CSF space of newborn animals and combine that with uh, the biweekly PPS regimen um, that we've used in this preliminary work. At the end of the study, um, we will similarly measure uh, markers of CNS disease, lysosomal storage, and then we'll also determine how well uh, the gene therapy was distributed throughout the nervous system. So we're very excited about this upcoming work and how it may uh, ultimately translate uh, to patients one day. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, I would like to briefly acknowledge and thank um, the members of my lab, uh, Matthew Ellenwood, and the former Ellenwood lab at Iowa State, um, who have either directly or indirectly contributed to this work and or assisted with uh, the dog colony. There are a number of units and folks at Iowa State uh, that help support our program, but chief among them is Lab Animal Resources for the excellent care that they provide our animals. Uh, the work presented today was funded by grants um, from the National MPS Society and also the ISU College of Veterinary Medicine. Historical support uh, from the NIH and also industry partners has helped support the colony um, and support studies from which archived tissues uh, could be gathered. So I look forward to meeting you all at the question discussion, discussion session. Uh, thanks again. Thank you so very much, Jody and Leela, for your talks today. Those were wonderful. I wanted to, before we get into questions, uh, make a couple of comments. I wanted to remind uh, the attendees that we are taking questions uh, and that there is a wonderful session that will really focus on inflammatory aspects of these diseases and their therapy next Sunday with Dr. Linda Polgren and Dr. Uh, Michalina Yakovino. So it will cover some of the science and also clinical trial oriented <clears throat> to the inflammatory parts of the disease that we had here uh, uh, so wonderfully uh, uh, overviewed uh, by uh, Dr. Leela and Dr. Jody. So I'm looking for some questions here, uh, but while I'm reading these, I'm going to go ahead and start on. Uh, and this is thrown out to both of you. Do you think that the PPS is actually getting into the central nervous system tissue, or it's just exerting an effect on the immune system that shows up as an effect in the brain? I guess, Jody, you could go first if you want. <laughs> or I could, I could try. Maybe we could both try men together. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have a, a, a great answer. I was going to suggest the same thing if you wanted to jump in. I know it's a, it's a large uh, molecule, um, so if there are some alterations in the 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 blood brain barrier, that barrier that kind of keeps stuff from the blood out of the the central nervous system, I suppose it could be getting in. Um, we unfortunately don't have an, um, Leela, maybe you, you do or know of, um, we haven't actually looked at, at PPS uh, the, for the, the compound specifically in any of the tissues, so I'm not quite sure. Um, I think either is plausible. Right. Well, we know um, actually from the companies that PPS is actually a whole mixture of various little chains. It's a large compound, but you have these chi smaller chains, which they're not sure which one of the actually active ones. Mm -hmm. So maybe one of these very small chains that are actually getting into the brain, there might be some leaky barrier that's actually allowing them to get in. Um, we haven't actually tracked PPS in the brain because it's very hard to do. <laughs> But um, we're working together with Bene, where they're actually trying to tag it uh, with a fluorescent marker or something smaller, because as you know, fluorescent markers may be too large or actually to, to follow into the brain at times. So 
It could be, like I said, one of these small chains that's actually the active PPS that's getting in, leaky barrier or some other way it's getting, but I, I think it's actually getting into the brain one way or another. Well, certainly you, you have documented in your work and it's been uh, confirmed in the three beak dog model that we're seeing an effect in the brain tissue. And there were two uh, really exciting findings when you started to identify these uh, issues and present them, Leela. One was that we had an effect in brain and spinal, uh, uh, cerebrospinal fluid. And the other was, and this just rocked my world, we were getting gag decreased and I had and I'm I uh, and this relates to one of the questions we have. What the heck is happening here? Do you think I have my thoughts, but I'd like to get your opinion on why do we get gag decreases? <laughs> well, like I said, these are all hypotheses still that we have. I mean, that's being worked on by various groups. We actually think that PPS is helping the integrity of the lysosome. It's making healthier lysosomes. So if you're having a healthier lysosome, the machinery is gonna work better. So even though you may have a reduction in enzyme, whatever residual enzyme is there is actually helping to reduce the gags because the, the, the actual lysosome is better. Um, and you also may be helping with autophagy because we do know that there is an issue with autophagy in the MPS disorders. And we do have some preliminary studies where we do see PPS helping with the autophagy processes. So you are improving autophagy also. So I think it's a whole combination of things. It's kind of like a boost to the to the system. It's actually making it healthier. I think of it sort of, uh, it's not a mechanistic uh, analogy, but it's kind of like a Swiss army knife. There are different aspects to PPS that are effective at different aspects of the, the disease. One is lysosomal biology, one is inflammation, uh, one may even be uh, in interacting somehow as a chaperone, because if it's a an oligosaccharide type molecule, we, we can't dis, uh, dis, uh, 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 take that off the table either. But exciting results regardless. Also, I was really intrigued as to the update on the pediatric patients, because I think that's a really important issue because so much of your work showed a prevention of bony disease in the models. Right. We did have a question, and I'll put this out to Leela because I know you addressed this in some of the dog work. What is the difference in terms of efficacy between oral PPS and the subcutaneous injections? Because I think you addressed that in the MPS1 dog work. Yeah, we also did it in the rats. Um, so we know that in the oral formulation, actually only 98% of it is actually eliminated in the urine. So the body just maintains 2% of the PPS to be distributed. Whereas subcutaneous, you're actually um, maintaining 25% of the PPS. Only 75% is actually eliminated. So it's actually a biodistribution um, matter. So that's why we're getting better results with subcutaneous versus the oral. And Even of course- The oral did have some effects with just 2%. And, and of I, course, for Elmeron's indication, uh, it's gonna be exercising its effect at the bladder wall so that it's eliminated in the urine is not a bad thing. Um, Right, but the other effect, the other downside of the oral is that you do have gastrointestinal um, side effects. Okay. So it has to be monitored, and uh, and it's not. Uh, there are there are very very few clinical studies that were done with children. So it's not recommended in children. So are these? Uh 
GI side effects, sort of typical NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory sort of side effects. And this we has been not other... recommended in adults. Like I said, not children. There's been maybe one study in children. Got it. One question related to the oral formulation. There have been some uh, retinal uh, findings, uh, and there have even been some uh, uh, lawsuits that are seeking damages, et cetera. Uh, and I know Jody will be able to look at this because she has a background in retinal uh, toxicology. Uh, do you have any insight as to whether uh, the injectable form is likely to uh, yield the same sorts of side effects? Because the frequency is going to be much different. I don't think she has. Sorry, Matthew, I wasn't sure if that was, I wasn't sure who, who you were addressing that question to. I'll put it out to both of you. Do you guys have any sense, and, and you may not, uh, because uh, it is not something that is particularly well addressed uh, in the human clinical literature, because this is usually used as an oral drug. In the cases of it, uh, Elmeron for interstitial cystitis, there are ocular pathologies that can show up as a side effect. Do you think that the subcutaneous uh, uh, weekly or biweekly injections is going to uh, be uh, lead to a lower risk of those side effects? I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either how to address that. Yeah. yeah. I will say in the, the canine model, we are, that's our kind of a side project is looking at uh, the retina and these dogs that we've treated with PPS. It was a short-term study, so I don't know that that will shed light on that particular question. Um, but I guess decreased frequency of dosing, that would seem reasonable that it, it might be less risky. Um, I mean, there is more retained in the system, uh, like wow. Lula just mentioned, so I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I think also one of the difficulties is I expect most of the human patients who see this as a side effect are uh, older in the population where there is an increased susceptibility and risk of ocular pathologies as well. So yeah. that's a very tough area to predict, but I know it's a concern that's been brought up a couple of times. Yeah. So thinking forward to uh, uh, the work that, that you're getting ready to start, uh, Jody, in combining gene therapy and PPS, what do you think a synergistic approach or a, a effect versus one that's additive may look like? Best case scenario. Yeah, I, good question. Um, I guess we are... Um, Hopeful. I mean, we've seen a, a broad effect, uh, and, and so have previous studies with PPS. Um, you know, the distribution or the, the the degree of transduction with gene therapy can be, um, I guess, variable sometimes. So, I guess we're hopeful that with that, uh, perhaps, maybe. Uh, well, hoping our gene therapy is going to be really good, but with that, maybe that broader coverage of the PPS um, and the gene therapy, uh, it, it could be a little tough to parse out because if we do correct that um, that enzyme deficiency with the gene therapy, uh, you know, what, what kind of effect will we see with, with adding the PPS in? But, uh, you know, hopefully we'll see some early decreases in uh, neuroinflammation and hopefully those will translate to even better outcomes. Um, our, our study is going to be a pilot study in, in quite short duration, so we won't have much um, in the way of, of lifespan data, et cetera. Uh, but um, I guess we're, that's, that's what we're hoping for. It, it will be exciting in that you're going to and are treating uh, these dogs from birth, basically. How soon after birth are you able to start your first PPS treatments? Uh, we, in this, uh, the data I presented today, it was, it was within two weeks of birth. Um, we could even start that earlier. We usually, we have our diagnoses within um, two to three days um, after birth. So um, we could even start 
PPS injections earlier. They're sub Q, so um, not too invasive. Yeah. It depends on just how tiny those 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 neonatal animals are. But um, we've been able to work with a compounding pharmacy and get a uh, adequate volumes to give. So. Good. It seems like getting a uh, good toxicology on the effects and safety of that in uh, young mammals might be a particularly important issue as you think about structuring future studies. Definitely. Agreed. I'm going to throw out a blue sky question, which is what, do you, what other sort of uh, immune modulating repurposed drugs do you think there are, might be out there? Uh, uh, that we could think about targeting next. Have we exhausted the group? I know that uh, Linda Polgren's looking at drugs that are uh, 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 biopharmaceuticals that really interrupt uh, the signaling pathways, uh, but what other small molecules do you think might be out there that we could look at? I'm looking at the expert right now. <laughs> um, It's a tough call, I know, but I, I guess, do you, do you think that this is still a rich field to be pursued? Oh, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. I mean, I mean, repurposing, I'm sure it, there are many small molecules that we could really look into. It's just finding the right, the ones to repurpose that'll have the right targets that we want to reach. Good. Well, it's certainly uh, encouraging to know that we have all of the important models from the mouse uh, uh, and the other rodent, the MPS6 uh, rat and the dogs and the cats, these are really valuable. And I appreciated, Jody, especially your presentation to give an overview. Sometimes uh, the importance that these models have brought to the MPS community and the ML community may be uh, forgotten because we've They've been around for so long, but I know Leela has been working on them for as long as I have, and many of the researchers uh, going back into the early 80s have been heavily dependent on these important models. And I look at other groups of uh, rare diseases where these models may not have been identified and developed, and I think in some ways they haven't made as much progress in certain respects. So uh, I really appreciate that perspective. They've been precious to us. They really have. <laughs> As we're getting ready to wind up, I should drop down and see if we've had new questions appear. I think uh, we have not. Uh, any other comments that you would like to uh, wind up with as we sort of close down this session? Um. I wanted to uh, uh, wrap up and say thank you very much. Uh, you are such a value to the society, both for your research, which we are so thrilled to continue sponsoring, and for your dedication as members of the board, scientific advisory board, and in the review process. And uh, continue the good work that you guys are doing. Keep, keep up the good fight. Thank you, Matthew, thank you. to the society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and with that, we will go ahead and conclude this session.